Uh, hey, everybody. My name is Josh. I, uh, I own the International Cyber Portfolio at the National Security Council uh, for the President. And uh, really excited to be here. Um, don't often talk about it, but uh, this specific topic is near and dear to my heart and uh, has been for many years. Uh, what I'm here to communicate today is the fact that we're very concerned and we're excited that lots of other people are getting interested in the topic of maritime cybersecurity. And the reason why we are concerned and the reason why we're pursuing policies to facilitate people focusing on maritime cybersecurity is because as we look across the portfolio of risk that's held by, um, you could call it the West, you could call it the modern industrial world, uh, we think that this is an area where we have not yet calculated accurately or even inaccurately the risk that we hold. And therefore, uh, it's a huge arbitrage opportunity. So huge opportunity for improvement. Um, so at the strategic level, what we've done is we've included uh, issues of maritime cybersecurity in top-level policy documents that we've crafted in the White House, uh, including uh, the National Cyber Strategy, which we just published about a year ago. Uh, it's the first national cyber strategy of the United States in, I think, 15 years. And uh, in that document, we identify that maritime and also transportation cybersecurity is a critical area for improvement. And then we've got uh, implementation plans that we're executing as a part of that to drive action in that space. And as I look out across the, the room, I, I recognize some faces, so maybe some of you guys are already involved in some of those activities. Uh, they're, they're bridging both the public and the private sector. And uh, a lot of it is just things like this, coming out and talking to people and letting them know that we're interested, letting them know that we're trying to find ways in which if there are barriers, we can take those barriers away, barriers to work, uh, barriers to other, other mechanisms that'll help promote this sector. Uh, so to go back to why we think that this is such a huge opportunity, arbitrage opportunity, one might say, or um, if you look at the actual, uh, uh, actual financial numbers, um, something at the order of magnitude of 25 cents on the dollar of, of, of GDP, U.S. GDP, and touches the water, that's approximately the same amount as the financial sector. But if you look at what the financial spe sector spends on cybersecurity, it is at the order of magnitude of, of billions of dollars, probably tens, possibly hundreds of billions of dollars a year. If you look at the... Uh, the, the maritime industry, uh, it's at the order of magnitude of millions of dollars to the point where it's very hard to actually find. Uh, and we looked, and we looked quite hard. And so as we have thought about it uh, in terms of what we have to do uh, in the White House, if we've thought about uh, what we owe to the nation, uh, we're looking for opportunities, big opportunities to buy down risk. And uh, this is probably the biggest one, uh, in my opinion. And that's why... That's why we made sure to put it in the actual strategic document signed by the president. That's why basically any opportunity uh, I get on a plane or get in a car, get on a train, haven't yet gotten on a boat, but that might be appropriate, uh, and go talk to people about maritime cybersecurity. Uh, and so what are some things that I think we're going to see over the next few years? Uh, first, I'd say that at the, at the sort of um, big muscle movement level, uh, I think that people still have not deeply wrapped their minds around uh, the convergence of IT and OT, which I imagine probably every single person in this audience is familiar with. And that convergence itself has first and then second and third order uh, uh, consequences that I think, again, people haven't used to calculate risk. And, uh, and that risk is going to have to be calculated at some point. We're seeing things happening every day where uh, for example, not Petya, where you have um, uh, OT impacts from IT compromises. There are other cases like uh, Triton that we're seeing, where you know out in the public we're seeing the the bridging um, of threats moving from IT to OT or trying to, and uh, we see those incidents happening in sort of ones and twos, and now we see them happening maybe a little bit more maybe tens, uh, but I, I really do think that this is going to end up following one of the traditional, uh, you know, curvature models, and uh, pretty soon this is going to be sort of de rigueur, and so it behooves us, um, us in the, on the National Security Council staff, 
and then maybe us as a, as a wider community of folks that perceive this to be a thing that is coming at us to educate as well as work to find solutions. And those solutions can be on the policy side, uh, they can be on the corporate side, or they can be on the entrepreneurial side. Corporate side meaning how do we build out policies, how do we build out mechanisms that allow us to uh, take into consideration those risks, price them into our own calculations for operating, uh, and then use that to drive decision-making processes down into organizations. Uh, an example of this would be how are ports dealing with this risk? And we've seen with NotPetya where ports were deeply affected um, by, uh, by, the, by the NotPetya attack. Um, and had to roll over to manual operation from digital operation uh, just because of a compromise in their business systems, not because of any OT compromise. Uh, again, I think that that type of activity, previously not calculated, previously not projected, uh, now is sort of working its way into the mentalities of the folks that are actually building those risk models for those organizations. Uh, so that's sort of on the organizational side. We need to spur the people that build those policies to think about, okay, how do I need to buy down this risk? What do I owe my organization in, or in terms of architecting policies, architecting legal contracts, architecting terms of service? Uh, how can those organizations themselves adapt to these new challenges? Uh, the next thing is obviously, and we see this outside, with companies uh, like those that are in the IT, OT, hacking village, where are there new technologies that we are going to need to develop and or build in order to enable us to have the capability or capacity to actually monitor these threats. Uh, and then on our side, and I'll just talk for maybe two minutes and then, and then open it up to questions, what policies need to be put in place uh, from the position of the United States government in order to make sure that people are thinking about these things, integrating them into their decision making, and not in any way held back by uh, regulatory constructs that were created well before this threat ever emerged, uh, how can we remove those so that folks have an opportunity to, you know, without constraint, pursue solutions to this challenge? Uh, and so that's that's why I'm here, um, and uh, I'd love to take questions. That's it. Anything? Great. Yeah, it's a great question. How do I compare the maritime industry to other industries that face the same or very similar uh, threats? Really, I think it's, we've seen the challenge of incentive structures. And so uh, the maritime industry um, seems personally just a bit more fragmented where you have products and services that are being provided to product and service providers that are providing those products and services to ultimate customers. And it's sort of like a cascading downhill relationship whereby disruption at any one level doesn't actually move its way back upstream. Whereas if you look at oil, natural gas, or power, um, those, those, those complex systems of systems are deeply integrated. And so the power company goes down because of a problem with uh, you know industrial control system. They themselves feel the pain. And therefore, as they look out across the, the, the landscape, they're thinking, oh, that thing that happened over there in that country in Ukraine, for example, might happen to me, and I know what my uptime costs are, the downtime costs are, and therefore, I'm going to start to build policies such that I can try and at least mitigate some of that risk. Whereas, like, you know, someone buys a ship, um, and uh, the shipbuilder themselves may not have the... Um, you know, doesn't doesn't have a relationship back to the customer if there's ever a problem with the vessel itself. Um, same thing with the port. Uh, ports have multiple different types of legal structures. So, you know, a, a port can be operated by the people that are actually running it, or they can lease space out to people that uh, that then operate a pier or a slip or, or whatever. And so, in the case where you have ports that are uh, leasing space out to operators. Um, it's just a challenge because the people that own that property, the, the, the port landholder, uh, 
they don't exactly have an incentive to ask the question like, what does your cybersecurity policy look like in terms of like crane operation or um, I mean other IT questions where you have had cases where malicious actors have sought to um, manipulate information resident on the networks and systems of people operating in the maritime domain and there are some I'm trying to remember some of the case studies and where I remember them from but um, organized crime has has sort of operated in this space in the past and so with these like multi-tiered relationships on the maritime space it's very hard to align incentives um, just because you have so many players um, and then in the power industry or other industries it's much more centralized uh, and that's where I think the comment that I made about policy is much more important because there it's sort of a good stewardship attitude that we have to um, impress upon the people at every level uh, where it's up to them for their long-term reputational uh, costs or sorry it's up it's up to them to maintain their long-term reputation that they should create policies that will allow them uh, to have some measure of a feedback loop when they see activity that might ultimately affect their customers or tenants or whomever. Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull this. Maybe a little bit. Okay. As a follow-up to that, our location actually has an international flight Yeah. So the question was, what's been the international um, dynamic in these conversations? And actually, on, on the government-to-government -government side, it's been uh, fairly good. Uh, other governments deeply understand this, and especially when you look at other governments that have um, different economic footprints in the United States. So there are other maritime nations that have a similar GDP breakdown that I made earlier, the 25 cents on the dollar of GDP touches the water for the United States. You have other nations that have um, a similar perception of risk and they're a lot closer to the maritime industries. And so they've been very receptive. And then um, the companies have also been very receptive as well. And I think that you'll see um, in the next few months some of the international organizations that have public and private aspects to them are going to start dealing with this problem and uh, running processes to try and get their membership to think about this problem. So actually, I'm pretty bullish. Uh, we've had good reactions so far. Any other questions? Well, what was it? Yeah, so this is a great, it's actually a great question and slightly different. I've got, I've got an answer for that, so I'm glad, I'm glad you asked it. Um, yeah, so the, the question was, um, what's the reaction been as we've, as I've and the three other people that care about this problem in the White House, uh, including the president, uh, have talked about this, and he does actually um, deeply care about this, uh, usually because of the math. You know, he understands the math very intrinsically. So, um, so... As we've had these conversations with folks, we have um, we have seen a lot of interest. And the interesting thing is, it's sort of like a, a pincer, a pincer movement. At the very top, people are interested in it. Very top people are interested in it. And then at the very bottom, I have like maritime executives who started off as um, as tugboat operators who then worked their way up and now own um, you know small and mid sized mid-sized businesses coming up and telling me things that I already knew, but they're like, hey, did you know that like this one piece of software that plugs in, you know, to some aspect of my, uh, of my, you know, GPS system or whatever, um, 
you know, has a, a, a direct connection to like Critical System X. And by the way, I saw that it's operated by a company that was just bought out by this nation that we have some concerns about. And uh, these are like actual operators, like tugboat operators coming up to me at events. And, um, and it's heartening to see because they themselves are starting to perceive risk uh, because I think, you know, the creative mind goes to places where you don't want to lose control of your assets, especially if you're on board, especially if your reputation is at risk. So it's actually been pretty good. Um, and uh, in the various places that we go out and reach and touch and talk about this, uh, people have been enthusiastic. I'd say the challenge is more on the sort of bureaucracy hacking side. Like, how do we how do we encourage ports to start building policies that lead to executives that aren't in that sort of chain of, of control or don't have a direct touch on the problem. And that's where uh, I think that we'll see some of the activity that will likely happen this fall is gonna stimulate those conversations. And those conversations are conversations about risk, they're conversations about um, compliance, and, uh, and those are really critical to have because, and I was not one of these people, like my, uh, my, uh, my background is such that I've been very lucky to often operate in places where I was just sort of given a task to go do and then let, let alone to do it. And uh, that worked out well for me. And so when I went to the private sector and had to run an organization through a, a compliance regime in order to do business with an entity, it was not my style. Um, but funny story, it was the reason why we ended up getting a, uh, a fire extinguisher that was up to date in our break room because it was on the, it was like literally on the compliance checklist for, you know, whatever the compliance regime we were undergoing was. And it gave me deep insight into how useful those mechanisms can be. And so starting that conversation with folks, even though I think for many of the people, most of the people, possibly all the people in this room, like that's not something where we usually go to, where we're like, man, if we really want to solve this problem, like we should go talk to the people that write FIPS. Yes. So, uh, not not my first option, uh, but actually probably in this area, one of the best options. And by having these conversations, it allows us to stimulate the people that aren't usually dealing with those problems and allow them to get in front of something. And, and they end up being, or at least in my experience, limited experience have been, have taken that on uh, very aggressively because they want to be ahead of the curve, right? They want their compliance regime to have elements in it that are forward-looking and are going to help them prevent catastrophe.